Hello, everyone, and Namaskar. So today's podcast is a continuation of the reading of the book titled Anandamurti, the Jamalpur Years. And this is a reading of the 21st chapter titled For the Welfare and Happiness of All. Spirituality is not a utopian ideal, but a practical philosophy, which can be practiced and realized in day-to-day life however mundane it be. Spirituality stands for evolution and elevation, and not for superstition in action or pessimism. All fissiparous tendencies and group or clan philosophies that tend to create the shackles of narrow-mindedness are in no way connected with spirituality and should be discouraged. That which leads to broadness of vision alone should be accepted. Late in 1957, Baba was walking in the field with a few margis, one of whom was Shashi Ranjan, a distinguished MP, member of parliament, with a gift for oratory and a pure-minded devotee who found no conflict between his educated upbringing and his single-minded faith in his guru. His devotion for Baba was so strong that he could not refrain from telling whoever would listen that God had taken birth once again in the great land of India, as he had done in ages past in the forms of Shiva, Krishna, Buddha, and other great masters. Often people would reply to him that if God were walking the earth again, then why was he not able to remove the poverty and suffering of the people? What was the use of a god who didn't think about his suffering children? Shashi Ranjan, in his simple, straightforward manner, told Baba what people were saying and asked him what reply he should give them. Baba told him to wait for some time. The answer was coming, but only at the proper moment. In late May 1959, Baba started giving a series of evening classes for acharyas on the veranda of the Jamalpur Jagrati. Normally, Baba's classes would range over a wide variety of subjects, anything from ancient history to applied science to agriculture, with philology being one of his favorite topics. Two days after the inauguration of the Jamalpur Jagrati, for example, he gave a class on the origins and development of different major languages that lasted nearly two hours. As usual, he sat on a wooden cot with a blackboard and a piece of chalk. Some 25 margi sat in front of him and watched as he traced the development of Sanskrit, Chinese, Russian, and other classical languages through a period of several millennia, translating sentences from one language to another on the chalkboard and showing the links between the related languages. On another occasion, he gave a long discourse on the mechanisms whereby different animals and insects protect themselves by emitting foul odors, the relationship between those emissions and their hormonal secretions, and how a human being's thoughts and emotions affect his body's odor by stimulating certain specific hormonal secretions, depending on the nature of those thoughts and emotions. These classes, however, were different. Baba asked the Margis to take careful notes and informed them that these notes would be compiled into a textbook of Ananda Marga philosophy, to which he would give the name Idea and Ideology. The classes lasted from May 27 to June 5th. They were conducted primarily in English, with occasional explanations in Hindi. Ram Tanuk Singh acknowledged as the fastest writer among them, took notes along with several others. 
After each lecture, they compared their notes, edited them, and presented them to Baba for additions and corrections. Five years of DMC discourses and eight volumes of Subasita Samgraha had already provided an extensive textual base for the spiritual philosophy of Ananda Marga. But Baba had yet to dictate a manuscript that contained all the fundamental tenets of that philosophy in one concise and definitive text. As had been tradition throughout 5,000 year existence of Indian philosophical systems, idea and ideology would serve as that text. 82 densely packed pages in which Baba would explain in a precisely honed philosophical language everything from the creation of the universe to the origin of life. As with elementary philosophy, many of the terms and ideas were similar to those of the dominant schools of Indian thought, especially Kapil Sankhya and Patanjali's Yoga Darshan. But as usual, Baba reinvented those terms and ideas in a way that gave birth to an entirely new understanding. An interpretation of life and the universe so modern, so rational and scientific in character that it became obvious that among his goals was the creation of a text that would project spiritual philosophy into the future, while at the same time preserving its link to the past and the birth of human spirituality on the Indian subcontinent. The title of the book came from the chapter entitled Psycho-Spiritual Parallelism, and his explanation of the two words, idea and ideology, summed up the underlying spirit of the text. In the end, when the mind's wavelength will, as well, become infinite, and those waves will also flow in a straight line, the mind will get transformed into the Atman, consciousness or soul. This state is called Samadhi. Here the psychic waves have attained a parallelism with the spiritual waves of the Atman. This psycho-spiritual parallelism is known as idea or bhava. When this bhava or idea is conceived on the psychic level, it is ideology. Ideology, therefore, is the conception of idea and nothing else. Hence, when we call some materialistic or political principles of a person, party, nation, or federation an ideology, it is a wrong use of the term. Ideology involves in it a spiritual sense. It is an inspiration which has a parallelism with the spiritual entity. As Baba generally did when he was teaching class, he gave frequent demonstrations to illustrate his points. In one of the afternoon sessions, after explaining the workings of the crude, subtle, and causal minds, and what happens to the mind after death, he called Dasara to the front. Baba reached out with his stick and touched him between the eyebrows at the seat of the Agya Chakra. Then he asked him what he saw. Dasarath replied that he was seeing many small balls of light of different colors. They were blinking and moving around and congregating near different people. Baba explained that these small balls of light were bodiless minds. After death, the unit mind moves around searching for a congenial environment until it encounters a proper body in which it can take rebirth. If your vision were subtle enough, you will see that there are actually thousands of unit minds moving nearby. If you are happy, then those unit minds, whose fundamental nature or characteristic wavelength reflects happiness, will gravitate toward you. That will increase your feelings of happiness. If you are in a sad mood, then those unit minds that are sad by nature 
will be drawn toward you, and they will make you sadder. If you are in a negative frame of mind, then the negative minds will come near you and reinforce your negativity. If you are positive, then positive minds will gravitate towards you and reinforce your positivity. It depends on your mind, on your own nature. Some of the philosophical concepts presented in Idea and Ideology were modern redefinitions of ideas first presented thousands of years ago, such as the interplay between the three fundamental causal forces, sattva, the sentient force, rajas, the mutative force, and tamas, the static force. Others were making their first appearance on the stage of Indian philosophy. Among these was Baba's explanation of the origin of life, an explanation that had long been the pursuit of both science and philosophy. After showing in intricate detail how pure consciousness passes through a process of involution, transforming itself into mind, and from mind into matter, resulting in the creation of structural bodies whose integrity is maintained through a balance between the resultant interior and exterior forces, he showed how this process of involution reaches a zenith point where in its very momentum, by reaching its apex, pulverizes portions of the material body. In this process of pulverization, those portions are transformed back into the crudest form of ectoplasm, thus initiating the process of evolution in which mind, already inherent in matter, begins the journey of returning to its original state, pure consciousness. Here is the specialty of the philosophy of Ananda Marga over other philosophies, explaining by a logical and analytical theory that mind is a creation of matter. This view is also supported by the materialistic schools of thought. But materialist philosophers fail to explain further, as they fail in explaining the rudimental cause of matter. Ananda Marga philosophy penetrates deeper into the ultimate cause of all the manifested effects and enunciates that matter is the metamorphous form of Purushottama, the nucleus consciousness existing as the nominal cause. Thus, as a result of clash within the material structure, a subtle basis created, and this in turn gives rise to the formation of crude mind, or unachita, which has neither the ego, I do, or second mental subjectivity, nor the first mental subjectivity, I am. Also presented for the first time in Indian philosophy was Baba's explanation of how the seed of creation sprouts due to an imbalance in the three forces of Prakriti, surging within the non-manifest, infinite consciousness. During the discussion of this elusive topic, Baba mentioned that sadhakas reach a stage where they feel that the entire creation emanates from them and is absorbed back into them again. They feel, I alone exist. When Baba finished his explanation, Acharya Indra Dev Gupta complained that such ideas were very difficult to follow. It would help if you could give a practical demonstration, he said. Suddenly Baba's face began to change. It shone brighter and brighter until some of the disciples felt as if they were gazing at the sun. Everyone began experiencing a mental change. A feeling of immense joy swept over them like a tidal wave until everyone felt that they alone existed, that the entire universe existed within them, billowing forth in an internal cycle of creation and dissolution. Then Baba opened his hands into Varavaya Mudra. While the disciples remained absorbed in trance, Baba slipped on his shoes 
and walked back home. No one offered him his shoes, as was the custom, or accompanied him to his house. When the disciples finally recovered their normal consciousness, they were surprised to see the empty cot in front of them. The final classes that Baba gave were on social philosophy, the final two of eleven chapters. Just as the nine chapters on spiritual philosophy began with the cycle of creation, the Brahma Chakra, the chapters on social philosophy began with the social cycle, or Samaj Chakra, expanding upon a theory he had introduced in his first official discourse, the gradual evolution of society. In his explanation of the social cycle, Baba traced the development of human society through the evolution of four dominant psychological classes. The first of these, which he refers to as the Shudra class, were those who survived through manual labor, characteristic of the first primitive societies. He pointed out that neither the sense of acquisition nor intellectual exploitation existed in that age. Though life was brute, it was not brutal. Gradually, the leadership of those formative societies passed into the hands of those who excelled through physical strength and personal valor. He referred to them as Khatriyas, or the warrior class. With the rise of the Khatriyas, the importance of the family developed, and leadership tended to become hereditary. As society developed further, the role of the intellect became more and more prominent. A reference to the mythology of any ancient culture reveals numberless instances where the hero of the day had to acquire specific knowledge from teachers. Subsequently, this learning was not confined to the use of arms only, but extended to other spheres such as battlecraft, medicine, and forms of organization and administration so essential for ruling any society. Thus, the dependence on superior intellect increased day by day. And in the course of time, real power passed into the hands of such intellectuals. These intellectuals he referred to as Vipras, and their age of dominance, the Vipran age. Here, a hereditary superiority became difficult to maintain. And so the Vipras, in order to maintain their power, actively tried and prevented others from acquiring the use of the intellect by imposing superstitions and rituals, faiths and beliefs, and even introducing irrational ideas. The caste system of Hindu society is an example. Through an appeal to the sentiments of the mass, this was the phase of human society in the Middle Ages in the greater part of the world. This continued exploitation and the necessity for the collection and transfer of goods in a more complex society led to the rise of a fourth psychological class, the Vaishas, loosely translated as capitalists, i.e. those who control the means of production and distribution. It was in this era, Baba said, that human exploitation reached its zenith. The psychology of acquisition stimulated the development of a psychology of exploitation and reduced the majority of the society to shudras, whatever might be their actual psychology. After discussing the rotation of this cycle from one class to another through the process of evolution and revolution, counter-evolution and counter-revolution, Baba called for the rise of a class of Sadbipras, those spiritually and ethically perfected persons who he foresaw would one day assume responsibility for guiding the Samaj Chakra through successive cycles without allowing the exploitation of the dominant class to crystallize. When necessary, these Sadbipras would apply force, intellectual, political, or physical depending on the class in power, 
to ensure that the greater mass of human beings would not suffer the pervasive social exploitation that has been their lot throughout the course of recorded history. In short, he proposed that the best and the wisest among us guide society, rather than allowing it to be bent to the will of vested interests. In the final chapter, The Cosmic Brotherhood, Baba reiterated that human society is one family and must be treated as such. He followed this with a detailed discussion of four objective goals that must be attained in order for this sentiment to take root. A common philosophy of life, a single constitutional structure, a common penal code, and the availability, production, supply, and purchasing capacity of the minimum essentials of life for all. Baba was careful to differentiate his approach from unsuccessful theories of the past, such as Marxism, which failed to properly account for human psychology. Every human being has certain minimum requirements, which he or she must be guaranteed. Guaranteed availability of food, clothing, medical assistance, and housing should be arranged so that human beings may be able to utilize their surplus energy in subtler pursuits. In parentheses, energy until now engaged in procuring the essentialities of life. Side by side, there should be sufficient scope for providing other amenities of the progressive age. To fulfill the above responsibilities, enough purchasing capacity should be created. If the supply of requirements be guaranteed without any condition of personal skill and labor, the individual may develop the psychology of idleness. The minimum requirements of every person are the same, but diversity is also the nature of creation. Special amenities should therefore be provided so that the diversity in skill and intelligence is fully utilized and talent is encouraged to contribute its best toward human development. Such a guarantee presupposed the necessity of a ceiling on the acquisition and accumulation of wealth. But the supply in the physical sphere is limited, and hence, any effort for a disproportionate or unrestricted acquisition of physical objects has every possibility of creating a vast majority of have-nots, thus harming the spiritual, mental, and physical growth of the larger majority. So while dealing with the problem of individual liberty in the physical sphere, it must not be allowed to cross a limit whereby it is instrumental in hampering the development of the complete personality of human beings. And at the same time, it is not so drastically curtailed that the spiritual, mental, and physical growth of human beings is hampered. Baba summed up the chapter in these words. Thus, the social philosophy of Ananda Marga advocates the development of the integrated personality of the individual and also the establishment of a world fraternity inculcating in human psychology a cosmic sentiment. He then gave a name to the new philosophy, Prout, the progressive utilization theory. Those who advocated this theory, he said, would be called Proutists. When Baba finished his final lecture, he instructed Pranay to send a message to Shashi Ranjan that the time had finally arrived for him to answer the question that Shashi had posted two years earlier. The Margis then set to work preparing the manuscript. One evening, on his way to the tiger's grave, a few days after the completed manuscript had been sent to the United Press in Bagalpur, Baba stopped at the railway crossing and asked the disciple to turn back to the Jagrati to fetch some paper, a pencil, candles, and matches. When the disciple returned and met the group at the tiger's grave, Baba dictated 
the five fundamental principles of Prout. He told the Margis present that these principles would in the future serve as the basis for the creation of a Sarbipra society. Then he sent Baidyanath to Bagalpur by the night train with instructions to bring those pages to the press first thing in the morning and add them to the end of idea and ideology. In September, Baba went to Motihari and gave a seminar on Prat philosophy for students. Sujit Kumar and Ram Tanuk took notes and presented those notes to Baba for correction. During the seminar, Sujit asked Baba if these ideas would be confined only to books. Why are you asking? Because I am frustrated with the present situation in society. Just wait, Baba said. You will find everything you desire in Ananda Marga. When the seminar was finished, Baba conducted DMC and then requested Indra Dev Gupta to form a students group, the first official organ of Prout, to which he gave the name Universal Proutist Students Federation, or UPSF. The following month, Baba held the first conference of Proutists in Jamalpur, further expanding Prout philosophy in another series of lectures that he asked the Margis to note down and prepare for publication. The notes from these seminars were published as Discourses on Prout, with the exception of a long, elaborate discussion on the seven stages of revolution. This discussion contained Baba's most radical ideas to date, a succinct manual on revolutions and how to conduct them. From the role of intellectuals and artists to the mobilization of mass sentiment, the Margis printed up the condensed notes as a separate booklet entitled A Discussion. But Baba eventually banned the book and ordered existing copies to be burned. Acharya Dhruva Deva Narayana was carrying Baba's umbrella on their way to Baba's quarters when Baba explained the reason for his decision. People kill snakes because their bite might prove fatal. But what about snake eggs? They cannot harm anyone. Why do people destroy them then? Because it is from the egg that the snake emerges. So those who recognize snake eggs destroy them as soon as they see them. Similarly, your organization is in the form of an egg, and those who recognize it for what it is will try to smash it and destroy it. You must exercise extreme caution in this regard. The students who attended these seminars went back to their respective universities and began organizing UPSF chapters. With the fervor of youth, they started preaching the new philosophy on campuses all over Bihar and afterward into UP and West Bengal. By the middle of 1960, they had begun the publication of two monthly journals, which they sold on campuses throughout northern India, one in English entitled Education and Culture and one in Hindi entitled Yuga Ki Pukar, The Call of the Age. For the first time, they had a concrete social platform through which to channelize their energies, and thereafter, whenever they came to Jamalpur, Baba encouraged them to work for Prout. The dreams they harbored of changing society now seemed to be within their grasp with the birth of Prout. Propagated, as Baba wrote, for the happiness and welfare of all. <laughs> 